Amen. So good to see you this morning. Have your Bibles with you or your Bible out with you. If you would, open it up and turn to Romans chapter 11. I was watching a Nat Geo documentary last night on the middle Mississippi River where the Missouri River and the Ohio River converge in the Ohio Valley and just make the massive, mighty Mississippi River. And one of the things that they were showing on there was the River Otter. And that's what I feel like right now. I'm so sweaty. The um, Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 32. I'm generally a short scripture preacher. This morning I want to read you a pretty long text of scripture, which is great. Um, there's nothing wrong with the public reading of God's word. And we probably should do it a lot more. And because God's word is the truth. Preachers can mess up the truth. But God's word is the truth. So I want us to know that what we're doing this morning is special because we're uniting with thousands of churches around America and around the world. And we're praying and standing with Israel today. And so we want to look at not just the fact that we're uniting by faith and through prayer before God and standing with the Israel nation, but the fact that we're praying for the Israel nation. Now, what I want you to understand first and foremost is we're not just praying about Middle Eastern difficulties. We're not just praying about the war in Gaza. We're not just praying about protection from Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran and all the other enemies over there. Folks, we're praying for the salvation of Israel because it doesn't matter about the victories in warfare if the soul is dead. So one of the things we need to keep right in the forefront and in priority position when we talk about praying and standing for Israel is certainly praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And I know King David in context is praying for a cessation of warfare in, the, in, in Jerusalem and in Israel and his kingdom reign. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a greater peace than the cessation of warfare. And that peace comes through salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That no war can corrupt even our New Testament tells us and instructs us, don't fear the one that claims he can steal and take the life, but fear the one that can not only take the life, but the soul. And that comes to Jesus Christ. So today we want to pray for and we want to stand with Israel. Now before we go any further, I want to give you just a couple of things. Number one, we want to invite you back tonight at 6 o'clock. It's 6 o'clock tonight, and we're going to gather here with some fellow believers from a church in Carson, Mississippi, that Pastor Robbie Hathorne pastors, and he and Brother Mark McNair, our executive associate, whatever, 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 pastor, we just kind of fill in the blanks on most weeks, but he's an awesome guy and a super team player, and we just get, make it happen, just get it done. And so we want to bless them with a send-off tonight from a mission charge and a church charge, what we can do to be praying for him and Robbie and the team that they're going to be on going to India. And we want to end with a time of fellowship, just breaking bread together and praying over he and Robbie tonight as they get ready to go on the mission that they're going on and the teaching and preaching that they'll be doing. So we want to invite you to come back at 6. It's not going to be anything that's super long, so we're not going to keep you a long time. But the good thing is we're going to feed you before we let you go. So, you know, I mean, that's a pretty good trade out right there, right? So there'll be some, we'll do some something. We'll get something to eat. But I want to remind you of that. And I also want to remind you that when you leave today, you're going to get a prayer guide. And we got them going out, both exits. So we want you to take one of those prayer guides. And we don't want it to be something that sits on your car seat or sits on your coffee table. We want you to take it, and if you're not having a quiet time right now, we would encourage you to start a quiet time, maybe in the morning. And you just do the quiet time and take each one of these prayers, read one scripture, pray the prayer before the Lord, and that can be your quiet time over the next, I don't know, two, three weeks, and you can keep working your way through that. And my prayer is that you will develop a habit of having an intimate, quiet time before God each day. We have to be able to hit the pause button in the business of life and be still and know that he is God. We need to take some time to be still and to be silent 
before the Lord. So pray for and stand with Israel. Romans 11, chapter 11, verses 11 through 32. And I just, I just want to read the whole text for us as far as this passage goes. And I'm going to come back and I just want to make two points and close today because it's pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> but I want to, to call your attention to just a couple of, couple of things. Beginning reading in verse 11. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? And we're talking about Israel. Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. To what? Make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? I am talking to you Gentiles. That's you and I today. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people, the Jews, the Israel, to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, through a wild olive shoot, that's us, have been grafted in among the others and now share the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, Israel, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if, you, if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, Israel, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening, in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godly, godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on all of them. And you say, well, Brother Brown, what in the world does all that mean? And there is a lot going on in that passage of Scripture. We could discuss theology. We could get, get deep with it, as deep as I can go. I'm sure there's people in here that could go a lot deeper in discussion than I can. There are some, a lot of things in there we can get messed up. And there's a lot of people that have them messed up and misinterpreted. But I want to keep it about the big picture this morning as we pray and as we stand with Israel. Here's point number one. This is going to really mess you up. Here's point number one. God has rejected Israel. 
but God has not rejected Israel. God has rejected Israel, but God has not rejected Israel. Because see, we just read that because if you look back in verse 1 of chapter 11, Paul tells you right off the bat, has God rejected Israel? And then he says, by no means. And then you get to verse 15 over there and you see that they've been rejected. If they were rejected. It was because of their rejection that the Gentiles was grafted in. So God didn't reject Israel, but he did reject Israel. But God rejected Israel, but he didn't reject Israel. So what in the world? Have we finally come up with a contradiction in the Bible that all the people that love to say the Bible's full of contradictions, we may have just stumbled upon a major contradiction that disproves everything in the Bible, right? No way. Absolutely not. There are no contradictions in the Bible as far as the message of God's word goes. You may can come up with some mathematical equations where some numbers don't add up just right. But I'm going to tell you what, you can do whatever you want to do with the numbers. I can tell you that God, the Holy Spirit, moved upon a little virgin named Mary. And she was found to be carrying God's son. His name was Jesus. He was born in a manger in Bethlehem. He grew in grace and knowledge and wisdom among men. He lived a perfect sinless life, thereby having the ability to redeem and reconcile us back to the Father. He took Calvary's cross as the sacrifice once and for all. He shed his perfect blemishless blood. He was dead, 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 not asleep, not knocked out, not, not, not dehydrated. He was dead for three days and then God caused the earthquake the stone rolled away and behold the tomb was empty our Savior lives our Savior lives. He walked and talked among men for 40 days teaching the kingdom of God. He went upon the Mount of Olives. Some angels came down. Some clouds took him up. The angels said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing? Carry yourselves around Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Not only did he raise from the dead, but he never left us alone. He endued us with the power and filled us with the Holy Spirit so that we could take the gospel message to the nations. Okay, so if God has rejected Israel, what does that mean? God has rejected Israel as the message carriers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. He said he did it because of their unbelief. Because Israel was so caught up in a religious culture filled with rules and regulations but void of relationship that they lost the central theme of the message of Jesus Christ which was exactly what I just shared with you. You say, well, I don't know how to share my faith. You just shared it. You just told the story of the good news. We look for these little quibby ways that we can manipulate somebody into making a salvation decision so that we can somehow mark a tally sheet in our churches so that we can feel better about ourselves. Folks, we can't do anything to manipulate somebody or coerce somebody to come to Jesus Christ and give their heart and surrender their life to him. Now, we can manipulate and emotionalize them to walk an aisle, pray a prayer, and then they go out and live like the devil and hunt the preacher back up to preach their funeral and say they've gone to heaven. It does not work that way that is nowhere in the scripture salvation is a long obedience in the same direction salvation is knowing that no matter how old you are when you submit and surrender your life to Jesus Christ you become a spiritual baby and you began to suck the bottle of milk spiritually and you progress to the, to the Gerber the, the peas and the I don't know about y'all but I really like the Hawaiian delight it was pretty good. I would share that with my boys. The peas, they had all of them. And then you get to the point where you relinquish the spoon and the fork and they begin to feed themselves and they continue to grow and they begin to do more and more on their own. And lo and behold, they, 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 they're like those birds that get out of the nest, they fly. And sometimes they fly back. And sometimes you got to get them out again. But they grow up. And they mature. And sooner or later, they're flying on their own. And that's the process that we're talking about. The Holy Spirit is in charge of that process. We need to quit trying to find cute ways to share the gospel and just share the gospel. We just need to tell them about the love of God. That God so loved the world 
that he sent his only begotten one and only unique son, Jesus Christ. Yes, he was a master teacher. Yes, he was a master prophet. Yes, he's king of kings and lord of lords, but he is Messiah. That puts him above all. He is Savior. The only one, only one ever that can save, that can redeem, that can reconcile, that can record my name and your name in the Lamb's book of life. Why did God reject Israel? Why did God cut Israel's branch off of that olive tree? Why did God take them away from the nourishing sap of the root of God through that tree? Why did he reject them? Because they did not share the message of Jesus Christ because they didn't believe it. Now here's the question. Why don't we? Is it the same reason? No, I believe in God. I believe that Jesus was the son of God. I've believed in my heart and I've confessed with my mouth. Yes, privately. But the Bible said the nation of Israel was rejected because they rejected the Messiah, God's only son. And the way we know that they rejected the Messiah was their unbelief in him because their refusal to share him. You don't share what you don't believe in. Let somebody find a good doctor somewhere that has made a diagnosis that two or three other doctors have not made. Man, we'll be all over Facebook with that. Man, you ought to go see Dr. So-and-so. He's so great or she's so great. We don't have a problem sharing something medical. Let a good story come across Fox News. Man, we don't have any problem posting or sharing about that or talking about that. We'll talk about that all day long. Man, what about all these things going on the campuses around with all these Hamas lovers and Palestinian lovers? Let me tell you something. I, I'm a Palestinian Hamas lover. I'm praying for their salvation just like I'm praying for the salvation of Israel. If you want to get this thing straight, it won't be done with tanks and drones. It'll be done because of the flowing blood of Jesus Christ because the blood that our Savior spilt for us has not lost one ounce of its power. That's the blood that saves Folks, I'm just telling you, that's where we have to come home and that's where we have to pray. We can get a hatred and a rage in our heart for what's going on in the college campuses, what's going on in the political scene, what's going on in the Middle East. But until we get a passion in our heart to stand in the gap as intercessors and plead the blood of Jesus over all that's wrong in our world today and speak up for the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. You say, I don't know how. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And then let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Man, you've planted a seed that the Holy Spirit will come along or send someone else to come along and the water of the Spirit will begin to hit that seed and the soil has been prepared by the Holy Spirit and lo and behold, there's going to be a little bit of germination, spiritual germination take place in the soul, in the mind, in the heart, in the body of somebody and next thing you know, that person that was living a lifestyle that looked a lot more like Lucifer than the Lord will begin to not be able to sleep at night because there's just something gnawing in his or her gut and then we're over here praying on the other side Lord don't let them sleep do they get it right with you Lord don't let them sleep do they get it right with you and they're riding down the road in their Chevrolet pickup truck because if you drive a Ford you just ain't right I'm sorry that was flesh that was not the Lord that was flesh but you're driving down the road in your pickup truck germane to the brand and K-Love radio's on 
And you hear a beautiful song come on and next thing you know, the Holy Spirit just speaks to your heart and you can't control your tears anymore. That you're crying so hard you can't drive and you got to pull over and you just get out and you just walk into the woods and you fall down on your face and you surrender your life to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and He hears you and He holds you and He seals you with a deposit of the Holy Spirit guaranteeing for eternity. And you come and you come to those that were interceding and praying and you say I've surrendered my life I want to be water baptized I want to be baptized in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit I want to testify of the internal change to the external world I'm transformed the old is passed away and behold all things are made new folks that's the gospel not only is that us sharing it but that's what it looks like to be lived out and that's what God has called us to do Israel didn't do it. They said, oh, we're going to stick with our system. Why you got to do this baptism one time? And we do ceremonial bathings two, three times a day. Every time we get dirty, we bathe. And you're saying you just got to be baptized once? Yes, because it's not about bathing the dirt off of the outside. It's about the internal transformation of the inside. That's why it only takes once. And folks, it ain't the water that washes away. It's the blood. The water is the symbol that shows the world what the blood has accomplished. It's the gospel. Israel chose system preservation over gospel presentation. And you know what's sad? All over the world today, There are churches fighting for system preservation. And they've turned their backs on gospel presentation. I'm so sick of hearing this traditional contemporary church stuff. I'm so sick of the worship war stuff. I wore the same clothes today for a reason that I wore yesterday. I went to a funeral yesterday. Precious lady, precious family, precious body of believers. Man, I worshiped. There was two ladies that sang, It is well with my soul. And man, I just, Lord, have mercy. I was worshiping. It was as beautiful as beautiful could be. And then I come in here this morning, and man, our band just goes off. And I was just worshiping. Beautiful as beautiful could be. And man, I went to this traditional church yesterday, and I had these same clothes on. The only thing different was I took my shirt in. And I said, I'm in a contemporary church this morning, so you know what? I don't have to tuck my shirt in. And you know what? I was happy I didn't have to tuck my shirt in because it hides my waistline a lot better. (laughs) So that's about the only difference between the traditional and contemporary church in my mind. I tucked my shirt in in one, looked a little more formal, and I left my shirt tail out today. Looked a little more contemporary. Because I'm going to tell you something. What I worshipped yesterday at Hefsa Baptist Church was God Almighty in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And what we're doing up in here this morning is worshipping God Almighty in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. The only difference is I did not tuck my shirt in. That's it. Don't talk to me about all that other stuff. Lost people don't have a favorite worship style. They don't know to. Matter of fact, if you're going to get a lost person, you better get some Christian rap up in here. Because they need some KB or some Lecrae, probably. Some of you just heart, just skip the beat. Is he really fixing to do that? No, no, I'm not, I'm not going to rap. But I know some people that can. And I think it would be kind of cool myself. But anyway, we'll let the leadership team vote on that. That way we can all get in trouble, not just me. So why did Israel get rejected? Real simple. They they didn't do their job in sharing the gospel. (laughs) That's it. They rejected the Messiah. You can't share what you don't believe in. So I'm asking why you come to church this morning. Did you come to church this morning because it appeased your guilt? Because you were raised that this is where you're supposed to be at 10.30 or 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning? Or do you come to church this morning to be with your faith family, to worship God with everything that's within you? And every chance you get to get with your corporate faith family, you're going to worship him. And you're not going to wait till a couple of opportunities down to the church house to worship him. I'm going to learn to worship him on the daily. I want to get intimate with Jesus daily. Daily. 
living a lifestyle of worship. What does that mean, Brian? I got to dance like David in my underwear? Please, no, Lord, no. <laughs> Don't. Yeah, that's in the privacy of your home. Blinds drawn, curtain closed. But I want to tell you what, I hope we get the passion of worship that King David had is he was dancing before the ark of the Lord. Now, wait a minute. King David was so caught up in worship because he was dancing before the ark of the Lord that had been lost in the battle with the Philistines, that had been taken around to different places, had finally gotten over to Obed-Edom's house, and then David and the guys came and got it. And when they went and got it, two guys tried to touch the ark, to steady the ark, and God said, I don't need you to help me to be steadied. And so therefore, you know how many times we try to prop God up? We're scared to pray for people's healing because we want God to have an excuse in case he doesn't heal them. And God is the one that chooses where healing flows or healing doesn't flow. We got to, by faith, trust that God made the right decision. But how many times have we put our hand on the presence of God and said, Lord, if it be thy will, it is going to be God's will. Just pray for life. And then be man enough and not prideful too much that you can trust God with the outcome. Well, Lord, I don't want you not to heal them because that's going to make me look bad. And if I go around praying for people, they don't get healed and all of them die, then they're not going to want me to pray. Look, I was scared to pray for some people because I went through a process about two years in my life that everybody I prayed for died. <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, they're going to kick me, slam out of ministry. They're going to hire me at the funeral home, but they're going to throw me out of the church. Nobody's going to pray for them. But then God radically shifted my mind. The greatest healing that can come for a Christian man or woman is to cease breathing in here and start breathing up there. That is the ultimate healing. We're the one that's let sin cause us to get scared to death of death and we get anxious because of death. But death is God's transitionary peace to get us to him. But David was dancing passionate before the ark of the Lord. What did the ark of the Lord represent? The presence of God. Yes. Folks, I don't know about you, but every time I come into this place and every time I go into another church, I feel the presence of God. There is no difference from the moment that David was dancing before the presence, the ark of God, than there is every time we get together where two or more gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. We are in the presence of the Lord. Don't be passive in the presence of the Lord. Be passionate. Do like King David did. Boy, Michael, his wife was up in that second story window of that palace talking about how undignified he was. And then when she confronted David with it, David said, honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's right. If you think that was undignified, and he just probably busted out in one of the biggest Jesus jigs you could ever break out in, right in front of her, right in front of the whole castle, palace, he said, I'll get even more undignified. Let me tell you what's not dignified. What's not dignified is to hang the naked body of my beaten Savior upon Calvary's cross. What's not indignified is to bury that crown of thorns in my Savior's beautiful brow. What's undignified is to beat him with the cat of nine tails till he was barely within an inch of his life. What's undignified is to strap 150 pound stipes of a cross on his back and he falls and brush his beautiful face on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem on his way up the Via Dolorosa to Mount Calvary at Golgotha. What's undignified is what they did to Jesus. You ain't seen undignified when I worship the risen Savior. Come on, man. Woo, let's just get undignified. Come on. We've gotten way too educated to be passionate about God. We're more theological than ever, but we're less passionate. We've read more books, but not this one. We read prayers, but refuse to pray them. Now Israel was rejected. Israel was rejected for not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So church, what do you think is going to happen to us if we continuing to use the excuse that I don't know how to share my faith?
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Folks, if that's all you do with another person and then follow that up with continuing to pray for them and to intercede for them, you just watch what the Holy Spirit is going to do when you get a passion for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Brian, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Here, here, here's the answer to it. I don't know. You just simply say, I don't know. And they're going to come back and say, well, what do you know? And here's all you got to do. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. <laughs> how can you mess that up? It's like answering Jesus in Sunday school. It's always the right answer at some level. I don't know about you. I was, all, I was hardly ever paying attention as a kid. Jerry Buck Pippen would say, Brian, can you answer that? Jesus! And then after five minutes when he thought about it, scratching his chin, he'd say, yeah, that's right. Wasn't the answer he was looking for, but at some level, Jesus in the church is always the right answer. But you know what? On every level, even in the world, Jesus is always the right answer. Amen. Just bring it back to the point of origin. If it was good enough for Nicodemus, man, it's good enough for you and me and them. You must be born again. Born again. Well, what does born again mean? For God so loved the world. <laughs> Just keep coming back. And you know what? They may walk away from you saying that is the the most ridiculous presentation of the gospel that I've ever been approached with in my life. But you know what you've done? You've passionately shared the gospel of Jesus Christ and God has always used the foolishness of men to accomplish his will on the face of this earth. It's not about your eloquence or my eloquence. It's about his power and his authority. We get too caught up in how we're going to do this. And what we need to be caught up in is he's already done this. Yes. We just need to share it. And watch what he can do. And you know what I was thinking when I first saw him today? And I mean, just spontaneously, everybody started clapping. And there's way too many white people in our church to keep that kind of beat. <laughs> and it sounded like really good. And I even looked at Mitchie like, are we doing that? I thought it was on the click track or something. But I've noticed that, man, we're, we're, we're doing good. We were keeping the beat and everything. And you know what? The first picture that came to my mind is what it must have sounded like after Israel had marched around Jericho's walls for seven days. And then when the horn started to blow and the shouts of praise started to go and the wall started to fall down, that's what I envisioned that was going on during worship this morning. There was walls falling down. There was walls falling down. That means, man, you go in there on the enemy's territory and you take back what he stole from you. Amen. That's what's happening this morning. He might have stolen your faith. That faith you need to quote John 3.16 in the presence of someone else. That faith you might need to just tell the narrative story. From Gabriel's announcement to Mary all the way through the resurrection, the ascension, and the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. To tell the narrative story of the Savior. Tim told it this morning, didn't he? He said it. He didn't even know that was part of my conclusion. He just messed me all up. And then I looked at him and said, whoa, that's affirmation. He had no idea I was going to be telling the, the Exodus story as a, as, a, as a typography of the Jesus story. But they were in slavery for over 400 years. Y'all know the story God sent Moses and Aaron Finally, after all of the plagues and all kind of other stuff, Pharaoh relented and let them go. They were standing at the edge of the Red Sea and all the army of Israel, Egypt was behind them, closing down on them. They were fearful and they were scared. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Stretch out your staff. And a great wind began to blow. And that wind blew so much that it parted the Red Sea. And it said that Israel walked across on dry ground. They got on the other side and it said the armies of Israel got into the sea and they were coming because they wanted to get Israel back into bondage of slavery. 
But God had a plan. He spoke to Moses again. He said, stretch out your staff. And God caused the waters to come back together, thereby slaying all of the armies and the chariots and the horses of Egypt. And the Bible says not one, not one survived. There was a catastrophic defeat of the enemy that day at the Red Sea. And God showed Israel that day, even though they didn't trust him, he showed them that day that I don't want you to go back into that bondage. Folks, I want to tell you something. You may be sitting here this morning. You may be saying, boy, if, if I could just see God part an ocean, I could believe. If I could just see God cover all that, Israel, all that Egyptian army up in that Red Sea, I could believe. If I, if I could just see the cloud by day and the fire by night, if I could just see a miracle that real, I can believe. Folks, that ain't nothing. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. God wrapped himself in our flesh to become a man. Now, he didn't surrender deity. 100% man, 100% God to live among us to redo and to do right what Adam and Eve did wrong. And now he redeemed, purchased back the right to be our Savior. Let me tell you something. You can't read about the birth of Jesus through a little virgin girl named Mary, 12 to 13 years old. You can't read about the life of Jesus. Sinless, full of miracles, full of the will of the Father. You can't read about the passion of Jesus leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, leading up to the resurrection of Jesus leading up to the ascension of Jesus, leading up to the sending of the fullness of the Holy Spirit to not be withdrawn again until Jesus comes again. You want to talk about miracles? The Red Sea ain't nothing compared to what God has shown you and me. The cloud by day and the fire by night is nothing compared to the enduing with the Holy Spirit's power and authority in our life. Well, Brian, it says even in those 40 years of wilderness wanderings, their sandals didn't wear out. How many of us can testify sitting in here today that we've already been in situations numerous times in the numbers of years of our wanderings in life that we should not be here anymore or things did not look like they were going to work out, but yet we're sitting here today and we can look back and see where God did not let our sandals wear out. I don't know about you, but he has certainly taken care of me. Folks, we've seen the miracles. We just refuse to admit it sometimes. Because we know if we admit how miraculous God is, and we take him at the word that he wants us to be obedient to, that means we're going to have to submit fully to the holiness of God and be truly set apart and anointed by God and let the lust after the things of this world go. He's not calling us to move to a desert He's not calling us to join a monastery. He's not calling us to take a vow of silence or chastity or in poverty or anything else. He's calling us to become his messengers of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will never, ever, 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 like Taylor Swift, never, ever be rejected by your in my God. Yes. And you say, well, Brian, well, what does that have to do with praying and standing with Israel? We can't pray and stand with Israel until we are the church, the Gentiles, that God has died and rose again for us to be. 
when we become the church fully enveloped in the Holy Spirit of Almighty God and led by Him, not by how we worship, but who we worship. Not by is it expository preaching or topical preaching. Is it biblical preaching? Not by anything else other than the commonalities of the faith, praying together, listening to teaching of the word, growing in the word, fellowshipping and breaking bread together, living in community, learning to share the gospel more and more and more and better and better and better, loving one another, not being easily offended, and going and taking what that love is to the world. Now we're the church. Now we're the Gentiles. Now when all the Gentiles come in, then Israel can be grafted back into the vine. And you say, well, how's that going to happen? That's a whole other sermon. Whole other sermon. But I can promise you God's got a special plan. And he has not turned his back on the nation of Israel. And if God has not turned his back on the nation of Israel, I can tell you real, real, real bluntly, I am not going to turn my back on the nation of Israel. People can say, well, boy, Israel's not perfect. Are you? Am I? Well, aren't you glad God didn't turn his back on us? And I'm not praying that Israel go in there and kill everyone that's a Palestinian. Heck no. But I'm going to tell you what, if there's an enemy and there's a terrorist out there, I pray that before Israel can even get to them, God strikes them down. I pray that it doesn't take a drone strike. I pray that the, uh, 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 the same thing that happened with the plagues in Egypt can start going. Matter of fact, why don't we pray that? Why don't we say, Lord, can you just send the plagues that will take out the bad operators in the Middle East? Why don't we by faith do that? Wouldn't it be awesome to wake up and on Fox News hear about hundreds of thousands of people that have just ceased to exist on the face of this earth because of how they were standing against God? You want to talk about a revival starting? Let's share our faith. Let's pray and stand with Israel. And let's never, ever, ever have to have the concern about will we be rejected by God. It's the gospel, man. And I pray that everyone in here has heard loud and clear the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't have a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost altar call and say, if you have not given your life, surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, would this be your day of salvation? You may have played around with Jesus. You may have toyed with Jesus. You may have had an emotional experience with Jesus. But I'm asking you, have you fallen on your face with no other options of salvation and come to the point where you realize you cannot do this and you cannot accomplish this on your own? that it's only the work of Christ. His grace that you put your faith in. And would you cry out to him this morning, Lord, I want to be saved. And you watch what God does in your life. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come. There'll be prayer partners in the front. There'll be prayer partners at each exit. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to go very far. You can just go to the nearest prayer partner. And all you have to say this morning is, I want to be saved. And I guarantee you, God will take it from there. We want to know about that decision. We want you to report it back to us. We want you to get your name and your phone number because we don't want you to just give your heart to Christ, make a decision, and then just be left out there floundering. We want to link up one-on-one with you. And we want to start making sure you're feasting on the buffet of God's Word. We want to make sure you know what prayer is. We want to make sure you start in the excitement of a new relationship with Jesus Christ. Sharing your faith right off the bat. We want you to grow and become a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
And folks, that don't take place in a six-week program. That's months and years and years and years. Matter of fact, if you want to believe it's not true, you can. But the truth of it is, it's a lifetime. We never stop being discipled. I want to pray for you. Would you stand with us? Father, I believe that the gospel message has been shared in this space and in this platform today. I believe, Holy Spirit, you are working in lives and hearts in this room and online. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that right now would finally be the breaking point for some folks in their life that have been living according to their own rules and their own system and their own desires. And I pray that this moment would be the moment that they would surrender it all to you. No more playing. No more experimenting. But just a surrender, a confession of sin, a forgiveness of sin, a repentance of turning from sin and living and learning to live your life for the rest of our lives so that when we stand before you, we hear well done good and faithful servant. I pray that today is the day of their salvation. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.